Hey everybody, this is the next video in our series on mediation and moderation. Specifically today, we're going to focus on serial mediation, meaning M X to M1 to M2 to Y, with only two mediators, and adding a covariate. So this is model 6 using SPSS's process, version 3. So I've done a little diagram of the model visualization and added the labels mainly for people who are wanting to do this in R so they can see what I'm talking about, but it also helps to see the labels. And this is the same template that is in Hayes' old templates. So what happens is we pick some X variable here and we're gonna use it to predict Y, which is the C path. And then we're gonna use it to predict M1, so whatever uh, mediator is first. Use it to predict M2 with M1. And so our second mediator, and then use all three to predict Y. And then the, what we're gonna do in this video is also show you how to add a covariate to that analysis. That essentially is a constant adjuster of Y. So it's in every equation. Specifically for our example today, I have some old faculty evals. And what we're gonna do is predict for Y here, this overall course rating. So what predicts what students are going to say about a course from one to five, where five is great and one is I hated it. The first thing we're gonna use is X as what grade did you expect to get in this course? Because students who make higher grades tend to be more satisfied. Not a perfect correlation because sometimes they hate a course but they do well in it, but generally the better they do, the more they like the course. We're gonna say that's mediated by the representation of the grades in the course. So are the exams, you know, did the exams match the material as M1? Are the grades fair? Is the grading system fair as M2? And then our covariate is, is this a course I wanted to take? So as you know, if you're watching my statistics channel, I teach lots of statistics courses and no one wants to take that noise. So um, tend to see lower overall evaluations because students are required to take the course, which has nothing to do with me and has everything to do with the curriculum. So what we think is happening is that there's a relationship between the grade they make in the course and the rating of the course that is mediated by the way the course is graded, right? And so we're gonna see if there's serial mediation, meaning X1 to M1 to M2 to Y. So that's our example we're gonna lay on top of a serial mediation model. Let's get into the nitty gritty here, which is first starting with power. So with power, you always have to figure out how many predictors do you have? And we wanna do this for the final model because we're most interested in C prime effectively or the um, direct and total effects. And so we wanna know how many variables are in this final equation. That's a little bit harder when you have categorical variables. Thankfully, none of these are. So we've got CV1 as one predictor, X as another, M1 and M2. So that's four predictors in our final model. So essentially we can also count how many arrows are going into Y. So there's four of them. So we're gonna have four predictors. And then we also care about R squared. So what we can do is think about total R squared and this will at least power the, the <clears throat> the overall model. It won't necessarily power the mediation part of the model, um, but we can at least make sure we have enough participants to find um, the effect of all the variables added together, and then we'll see if mediation happens. The, the better way to do this would be to simulate this sort of study uh, and run a lot of uh, bootstrapped examples, but I, knowing that lots that's difficult for lots of people, we're gonna do this kind of the quick and dirty way using G power. So let's open that bad boy up. Okay. All right, so what I'm gonna do is pick F test, come down here and pick linear multiple regression, uh, R squared deviation from zero, because we just wanna know how, how much power do we need for our final model with all of the predictors. Click determine. What we can do is from correlation coefficient, squared multiple correlation, row squared. Here, this is where you can enter R squared. Let's pick a random one, 0.12, so kind of a medium to large effect size. Calculate and transfer to main. That's gonna translate R squared into Cohen's F squared. Alpha is 0.05, or your favorite version of alpha, 0 0.10, 0 0.01. 
power of 0.80 is kind of a big uh, industry standard, but you can increase or decrease that. And we have four predictors. So since I'm on a Mac, it hides off the edge of the screen, so I'm just gonna hit enter. Right. And it says I need uh, 93 participants to find the effect I'm looking for if um, the effect is actually uh, R squared equals 12. So that's a quick way to power at least the final equation. All right, so I'll cut and paste that in there and you can always find all of these examples on our OSF or GitHub pages. So those are linked in the comments box below. All right, now we're gonna pop over to SPSS and we're just gonna jump right into the analysis. Remember, if you ever need help with data screening or understanding power or any of the steps that we're taking, the why we're taking them, I have more videos on those exact topics, but try to keep these short. So we're just gonna kind of walk through this, assuming that you've seen it before. If you haven't, there are more things that you can watch to get more background detail on. Okay. So here's our data set in SPSS. We actually have a bunch of different questions from our faculty eval sheet, but we're only gonna use a couple of them. And so I wanna check and make sure the data is at least somewhat accurate, meaning that people do not have scores over five or under one. Um, and there should be a nice range in between. So let's do analyze, descriptives, frequencies, and you can use descriptives as well. So we're gonna use question one, three, four, 12, and 15. Right, so question one is why three and four is moderator, I'm sorry, mediator one and two, uh, 12 is our covariate, X uh, is question 15. I don't really wanna see frequency tables here, so I'm gonna turn those off. Under statistics, I can ask for the mean, the min and the max, maybe get some standard deviation in there. Do you want them to look at skew and kurtosis? We could also have it make us histograms if we were so interested. But really, I just want to make sure the data looks somewhat accurate. Okay. So I'm going to look here. I don't actually have any missing data. I should do one of these examples with some missing data at some point. But I don't have any missing data in this example. And I have tons of participants. So these are thousands of evals across the years. The average rating for each one of these questions. Right? Standard deviation, not too crazy. Min and max do not exceed the range of the scale. So these are the average student evaluations for each course for each faculty member. Okay. So we have accurate data, it looks like, and we don't have any missing data. So looks good, no missing data. Now, let's work on uh, calculating our effects for outliers. Okay. To do that, I'm gonna need my chi-square table. And we'll see if we have as much trouble with this as we've had in the past on these, on this, in this series, something about Adobe, it's gonna play along today. And let's go over to SPSS and calculate those. So I hit the star button to go back to the data, although you don't have to go back to the data for this particular thing, you can analyze from either window. I just like to look at the numbers. So let's hit analyze, regression, linear. So we're going to run a regression analysis. This isn't part of process, but um, we're going to run that final model and uh, tell it to calculate our outliers for those because we can't do that as part of process. Okay. So this is do you have to remember what the variables are. So our dependent variable, we're trying to predict the overall rating. So that's question one. And then we're also going to include question three and four as our mediators. Question 12, whoops. Hold down control, not shift. Question 12 as our covariate and question 15 as our X variable. So we're just gonna put all of those in the independence box. Under plots, we're gonna ask for Z pred and Y, Z residual and X. This is gonna help us do assumption checks here in a minute. Histogram and normal probability plot. Hit continue. Under save, we're gonna cl click Malinobus, Cooks and Leverage. Continue. Now we're totally set up for outliers and assumptions. Click OK. So while that runs, let's come over here and figure out our cutoff score. So we said that there were four um, independent variables as part of power. So we're going to pick four here. And then we're going to scroll over and use P less than 0.001 because we want things to be really crazy before we cut them out. And so we're gonna use point, uh, 1847. Okay. 
Now we may not eliminate outliers in this analysis because these are real ev evaluation scores. And so we assume that maybe those are just really bad or really good classes. Cause we kind of expect the ends of the, of the distribution to be the outliers. Or maybe it's that students got really good grades, but they really hated the course or vice versa. So we're gonna use 1847 as our cutoff score. Back to SPSS here. So what we're going to do is create some columns that tell us whether or not someone was an outlier. So we're going to transform, compute variable. And what I've been calling this in the past is like bad Mahal. So these are people whose scores are outside the, the cutoff criteria. So we're going to pick Mahal Nobis distance right here. And then say anybody greater than 1847 is an outlier. Click OK. It's going to tell you that you did that over here. So I'm going to click back. And what that's done is it's created this column here of every single person's score uh, and a zero if they're not an outlier and a, zero, a one if they are. So if I sort my Mahalanobis distance descending because there are no negative scores, we can see that it's marked all these people at the top who have very high scores as outliers. And kind of as we suspected, so this one's scores are all really high, except question one, the last question, where the score is just a one. So that might be an outlier. And these particular scores are all kind of low, except there's a four on this one. So the pattern of the scores is unusual. Now let's go back to Word over here, fill in some of the stuff. So our degrees of freedom on this one was four, and our cutoff score was 1847. To calculate the cutoff score for Cook's distance, we're going to need to remember n and k. So what this is going to amount to is 4 divided by, let's come back over to SPSS, can't remember n, let's go here, it's like 37,000, 3,700, right? So here's n, 3742. Okay. Minus k, which is four predictors. Minus one, okay. And that number on the bottom is the degrees of freedom residual for your um, regression analysis. So we got three, seven, four, two, minus four, minus one, is three, seven, three, seven. <laughs> so four divided by three, seven, three, seven. If I can type on my calculator here, is 0 0.0010. Okay. I recommend doing at least three decimals, but if you want to do four on this one, I could round up to 0011. Okay. Let's also calculate leverage here. So this is 2k times 4 plus, the cat is trying to help, so please ignore, <laughs> divided by n, so 3742. So that's 8 plus 2, which is 10 divided by 3742, and it's 0.0027 if I round up. Okay. Let's repeat that process of calculating outlier scores twice more. So for Cooks, it's 0011. So I'm going to do transform, compute. This time we're going to call it bad cook. I'm going to have a laugh at that. Cook's distance, double click on it, greater than 0 0.0011, hit OK. And then let's just do one more, transform, compute, bad leverage, and clear that one out. Centered leverage, greater than 0 0.0027, hit OK. So now what we've got is three different forms of outliers, right? Mahalo persistence, which looks at patterns of scores, Cooks and leverage, which are about how much weight they're uh, influencing the slope, each individual person. And then we have um, uh, scores for all of these. So I could then create transform, compute, okay. create a total bad out outliers. <clears throat> And what that would be would be Mahal, no, our bad Mahal plus our bad Cooks plus our bad Leverage. And this will tell me 
whose scores are really discrepant. So this is going to give me, um, I did not mean to hit descriptive statistics. I meant to hit sort descending there. So I right clicked on it or control click on a Mac sort descending. And so I can see that there are several faculty evals that are discrepant on all of these scores. So they have problems on all three of our indicators for outlierness. And usually I tell people two strikes you're out. And so this is a lot of data. If you keep scrolling, it's like 130 participants have, or evals, have scores that are discrepant on two or more of our indicators. Now what we can do to get rid of those without deleting them from the data set is create a filter. And so since I haven't done this um, on any of our videos yet, let's exclude outliers in this particular case. Now if I were really doing this analysis, I wouldn't because these are in theory true representations of students' answers. Um, but let's just say we don't want any of those like particularly bad cases. Um, we're gonna assume that something maybe went wrong in that semester. So it seems weird to exclude such a large number of people, but remember we have 3,700 cases. So to exclude but not delete, let's do data, um, select cases. Okay. If a condition is satisfied, so we want to keep people. So um, what you wanna make sure you do here is uh, tell it to who you wanna keep. So click if, and we're gonna be able to create our own case here. Okay. So we're gonna say if bad total is less than two. Remember, it's two strikes, you're out. Um, this is kind of a rule that I've just used for a long time. A lot of the information about cooks and leverage can be found in Cohen, Cohen, Aiken, and West, which is a book about regression. Okay. All right, let's hit continue. And okay. Now, the nice thing about that is it doesn't delete anyone, and it creates you this filter variable of zeros and ones that are sort of use and don't use. So later, if you come back to this analysis, you can refilter it in the same way you did before. All right, now that I have done this though, Kat is trying to help me. <laughs> he's, he's trying to help me do statistics. That means that all of these pictures that we would normally look at are no good because we have um, excluded outliers. So we wanna run that uh, regression analysis again this time without outliers. So I'm just gonna hit analyze, regression, linear. It's all set up the same, but if you wanna turn off the uh, distances under save, you can just not see them again. Cause you don't wanna eliminate outliers twice, only do that once. And this will just give me those plots again that I can use. So we're gonna come down here to the charts and for a normality chart, remember we want it to be centered over zero and between two and two, so it's pretty normal, which you would think would not be true of, um, of uh, this kind of data. You think it might be skewed, but it's actually really normal. Okay, it's also very linear, so very close to the line. Remember, you have to cut it some slack. However, <laughs> this chart, not so cute, right? So we want the data to be between zero and zero, both directions. And um, the main problem is that it makes it's longer one direction than another. So it runs from two to four this way, although it is five to five the other way. So it's a little heterogeneic. And for homoscid SSD, we want it to be a big blob. So it being looking kind of like a bullseye is a little problematic, um, meaning that there are more dots here in the middle than on the edges. So we would say this is slightly heterogeneic and slightly heteroscedastic. Um, which isn't, again, not super surprising given that every individual in this data set is a different instructor. And so we might expect the scores to be kind of variable. Um, we do have very large sample size, so that will hopefully protect us from some of the loss of power in this scenario. Um, and we could also pick a heteroscedasticity option for standard errors, although I still haven't to totally figured out what they are in process three. So you'll need to investigate those for whichever one is best for your research. All right, now that we've powered through the data screening, and I'm gonna include all those pictures in this how-to guide so you can look at them later, um, let's go through and actually run this analysis. Okay, so I'm gonna analyze regression, and I have uh, process version three. 
Now, under model number, we're going to pick six for serial mod moderation. You can actually do up to four moderators at once. This video is only going to cover how to do two. We're going to use question one was the um, overall rating of this course. So just kind of back up for a reminder. All right, question one is our Y, 15 is our X. So we want to know if the overall rating of the course is predicted by the uh, score students are going to make. We're going to put in the three and four as our mediators and it will do them as one and two. So whatever you order, you put them in here will um, change the order so you can kind of drag them around if you want them in a different order. Um, so three is question one, is moder mediator, goodness, mediator one. <laughs> Four is mediator two. Ignore if I say moderator, like too much interactions today. So we're doing mediation, so three and then four. And we're gonna covary out or adjust for this is a course I wanted to take. So we're going to stick that in the covariates box. Under options, we could say show us the total effect model. That'll show you C. Um, we can also say effect size. I've mostly been leaving effect size out because in general people report R squared. Um, I haven't seen too much on the new effect sizes for this. And we could pick a uh, heteroscedastic inference and so I'll just pick the first one. Uh, and that's it for this one. So let's hit continue. There's no uh, categorical variables, so we'll leave that alone and we'll just hit OK. All right, so we get this big, super long output. So what I'm gonna do is just click on it, click on it again to be able to, normally you would type in here, but we're just going to hopefully get it to let us copy everything, come over to Word. And just type everything in Word. You know, hit save real quick in case something decides to crash and then let's get going. So the, the visuals here, it's a little off, but um, we can walk through what all this output means. Okay. So the uh, order of operations here is it's going to kind of run these in an alphabetical order. So the very first thing you're actually going to see is A1. So if you have trouble remembering what's happening, always come back to this picture here uh, while I'm explaining. So we're going to first predict X with, uh, I'm first, sorry, first predict M1 here with X and actually our covariate. So the covariate is included in every equation no matter what you do. And so that's here. And let's get this all on one screen. All right, so we could talk about the overall model. And this kind of depends on the goal of your analysis. If you want to talk about each of the equations one at a time, um, Generally, I think people only report the predictors, but this kind of varies by field and journal, right? So I could say the F statistics here, which we'll use these two numbers. So we're gonna have a pretty big degrees of freedom residual. Okay, and we'll pick up this bad boy here, plop it down there. P is less than 0.001. And we can also talk about R squared. <laughs> is 0.19. And so this point we would say is significant. We're predicting um, moderator one with the two variables. So we won't do that one again, but that's where you would get the numbers from if you need to report the overall models for each of these equations. Instead, let's talk about those predictors. So we can see that the grade in course predicts um, the fairness of the exams. And so this question I think is worded something like, uh, the exams are a fair representation of, or are a good representation of the 
course material. It's essentially a question about how well you think the exams match what you're doing in class. So we report that coefficient as B, right? So here's this coefficient um, and it's 0 0.43. Okay. The T value, when well, it's our degrees of freedom here, it's always the second degree of freedom from the F statistic equals, and then T is this one here, so 20.65. And our P value is just right next to it, 0, 0, 001. So nearly all of these are significant because sample size is so large. <laughs> and this is technically path A1. And then we could also talk about whether or not um, this is a course I wanted to take is an adjuster. So if people want to take the course, they tend to think the exams are a little more fair. The grade in the course also predicts their exam fairness. So if you're doing well in a course, you think the exams are fair, <laughs> which seems logical, right? Oh, I'm doing good. This, this is very fair grading. Um, but it's also true that this, if you wanted to take the course, you're going to say that it's more fair grading as well. So wanted to take predicts exams fairness. And we would report that one as 0.11. T would do the same thing again, 3609, 0.08, P is less than 0.01. Okay. There's no real path label for this one. It's just an adjuster. The next thing we're going to predict, go back up here, is M2. Okay. And so we're actually going to get A2 here. So remember, they're in alphabetical order, so this will help you remember. So I'm going to get A2 and D21. And so the, this one here helps us capture the X1, M1 to M2 to Y relationship. So this one's pretty important for the, the indirect effect through all of them. But A1 and A2 are important for the indi individual indirect effects of X to M1 to Y and X to M2 to Y. So what we're doing is creating three indirect effects of just through M1, just through M2, or both. all the way back down here. Okay, we won't talk about the overall model, but you could talk about the overall model. And what we want to say here is that the grade in the course uh, predicts uh, this question, which is the grading system is fair. This is overall grading. So we'd say that B equals point zero point one one T. Degrees of freedom are a little different now. 3608 because I have an extra predictor in the equation. Okay. So T is 805. P is less than 0.01. Okay. So I pull that number. Here's T and then here's P. This is the confidence interval. Okay. So uh, if, I th if I'm making a better grade, I think the grading system is fair, just like I think the exams are fair. Okay. Now we've got exam fairness. Okay, and this one, I'm sorry, is A2 on our diagram. Now we're saying exam fairness predicts um, fair grading. And that one's 0 0.56. T is 3608 equals um, 4561, that's a big effect. Okay, and this is the D21 path. Okay, so from M1 to M2. And then we have our adjuster, which says wanted to take, predicts fair grading. So if I wanted to take this course, I think the grading system is fair. 0.09. And that one is just less so than the others. Okay, these are all on the same scale, so I can kind of compare them directly. The next set of equations, right, it's going to give you x plus m1 plus m2 predicting y. So we're going to get the b1, b2, and c prime paths. So now we're getting into the, the second half of the model here, where we're getting b1, b2, and c prime. I think, here it is. Now let's look at R squared because this was the one we used for power and clearly this is a much bigger effect than I predicted. 
So let's start with overall grade predicts. Um, it actually does not predict. Um, rating of the course. Okay. Now that's really what we're interested in is this course rating grade. So it's a 0 0.02. T, we've even got a different degrees of freedom this time. So it's 3607 is 0 0.76. P equals 0 0.449. Okay. So I pulled that from here. Here's our degrees of freedom. Um, kind of hit enter here so they're all on the same page. Um, coefficient, uh, standard error, T, P. And this is C prime path. And next we've got the, uh, okay, question three, which is exam fairness predicts course rating. So if they think the exams are fair, they think the overall course is good. 0.55, T is 3607, uh, it's 25.91, P is, uh, continues to be less than 0.01 for these. And this is the A1, A2, I'm sorry, B1 path, goodness. And now we've got the um, overall grading system. predicts course rating. Okay. And so essentially we're saying like the exams are fair, the overall grading is fair. Both of those seem to predict my um, kind of global course rating. And so I have control over the grading system. I don't have control so much as the instructor over whether or not they're required to take it. Four nine P plus one oh one. Okay, and this one is the B two path. And then last but not least, we also still have our adjuster variable, which is wanted to take predicts overall rating. And that one is significant, unfortunately, because if they don't want to take it, they don't rate it as well. Sometimes you get those students who are like, ah, oh, I didn't hate this as much as I thought I would. I'm like, well, that's winning some points, right? <laughs> okay. P's less than point. Oh, oh, 001, and there's no label for this path. It just is an extra adjuster. So now we have all the main paths, but if you want C, you can get C. Um, you have to ask for it, so we ask for the total effect model. And this just will allow you to compare C and C prime, even though you might, you're going to have the indirect effects as well. So this is just if you want to report C. It's not. Um, people ask if this re is required to be significant. It is in this example, but it is not a requirement. Um, that would kind of be like the older thinking of like significant C to non-significant C. Okay. And so here we'd say the overall uh, sorry, course grade predicts overall course rating. Okay. So we'd say B equals 0 0.40. So for every letter grade, you get a half a point on their course rating. Uh, yeah. So you could just give them um, really great grades and you'd have great as instructor evals. I don't actually recommend this. Okay. So here's our degrees of freedom. So this is one thing you have to watch on these types of models is that they're gonna be different for every model. And you could say wanted to take predicts overall rating, and it's 0 0.37, T here is 3609, uh, it's 31.70 if I can round today, oh one. Just remember that this one is the C path with nothing else in the equation no other mediators. The covariate is still there. Now it reports all of those for you down here, but it leaves off the degrees of freedom. So that's one reason why I don't totally love using this total effects, direct effects box here. Um, because yes, those are the numbers that we figured out up here. Um, but you wouldn't know what the degrees of freedom are without having those other um, output pieces. So I'm gonna kind of ignore that because we've already gone over it. This is the kind of key part here. So that first indirect effect, it tells you how this works. 
so 15 to 31 to 11, or 1, and that is the effect of x through m1. So indirect number 1 here is the effect of x through m1. Okay. This one here, the second one is x through m2. Okay, those are traditional, just regular, simple mediation with the other predictors in the model. This one is the main one for serial mediation. The last one is like x to m1 to m2 to y. So you're kind of predicting this path of what's happening. And so a lot of times these models are actually done as structural equation path models, but you can do this through the regression and get the same answer. Okay. And so the way I tend to report these is indirect one, and you would have to explain what that means to people. Um, don't just call it indirect one. So you'd say going from overall course grade to exam fairness to um the overall class rating you know is mediated so we can say that um exam fairness mediates the relationship between course grade and overall rating and there's no good um picture for indir or, uh, symbols for indirect so i'm just gonna type indirect 0 0.24 if i round up and then what we want to do is include maybe the standard error. Okay, so that's the second column here. So 0 0.02. And then also include the 95% CI. And so that is going to be 0 0.21 comma uh, 0 0.27. So we have a very large sample size, so our confidence interval on this is kind of small. And then we could say the next one down is going to be um, uh, overall grading system. So the grading system mediates the relationship between course grade and overall rating. We would say our indirect is 0 0.05, so this is a smaller effect, but still there. Our standard error is basically 0 0.01. And the, now the 95% confidence interval, so 95% CI is 0 0.04 to, that's not 4, 4 to 0 0.06. And you can always use more decimals too, it's just kind of standard. And how do I know that these are mediated? Well, we want to make sure the confidence interval does not include zero. So if one's positive and one's negative, no mediation happened. Okay. And so we are saying that mediation happened because these do not include zero. All right, last but not least, we could say exam fairness and the grading system mediated the relationship between course grade and overall rating. Indirect is 0 0.10. Our standard error for this indirect is 0 0.01 again. And our 95% CI is 0 0.09 to 0 0.12. Since all these variables are on the same scale, I can kind of compare and it looks like the effect is most through exam fairness, then through uh, fairness to grading to Y, and then the, the smallest mediation effect is just the grading. Um, but all three of them are mediating the relationship between course gray, overall, like they, what they think they're gonna get in the course and your overall rating of the course. So, all of that jazz is how you would do a serial mediation model. It's model six with two mediators and process version three, complete with data screening and power. Stay tuned tomorrow for this exact same analysis in R.